2021, for many of us, cannot get here fast enough. I mean, I'm seeing Christmas decorations. I'm seeing people put up the lights. We're just sort of waiting for <laughs> this year to end and 2021 to begin. Uh, although I did see one meme that just said, what if 2020 is preparing us for 2021? I certainly hope not. Uh, but we'll see what God has planned uh, for this next year. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today and what we as a church uh, are going to focus on uh, for this next year. I want to talk a little bit about Elijah the prophet. And that's what the uh, text of the lesson will be today. That's how we're going to frame uh, what we believe uh, God has put on our hearts to focus on for this next year. You know, in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see Elijah's High water mark. I love Elijah the prophet. In, in one chapter, he finds out from Obadiah that Obadiah has hid a hundred prophets and has kept them safe from Jezebel. So Elijah is not alone uh, as a prophet. There are hundreds of prophets still. Uh, you know, God is protecting them. Elijah calls with really that confidence all the prophets of Baal onto Mount Carmel for this showdown. And you know that story. That's not what we're going to talk about today. He calls them. He calls King Ahab. Uh, they put an altar up before Baal, and he puts and rebuilds the altar of the Lord. And then they cry out to God. Uh, the, uh, those who uh, worship Baal cry out to Baal, and, and for hours and hours and hours cry out to Baal, and yet there is no answer. Then Elijah calls out to God. He says, answer me, Yahweh. Answer me. Then these people will know that you, Yahweh, are Elohim. You are the true God. And that you are winning back their hearts. And God answers by fire. It is this great victory. He sends, he's like, don't let these guys escape. He sends people after those false prophets. They cut them all down. And then to close out that chapter, after three and a half years of, of God withholding from the land of Israel, uh, a drought for three and a half years, no rain, all the crops dead, famine and people suffering, Elijah says, Get prepared, for it's going to rain. And God sends rain back onto the land of Israel. So on the righteous and the, and the wicked, uh, God rains down his blessings on the land. What a great moment for Elijah. What a great chapter of the Bible. And that really kind of described the year 2019 in the Orlando church. Uh, we saw more people become Christians and be restored to Christ than in probably a decade here in the Orlando church. Nearly 50 people uh, turned themselves in to be baptized and restored. Uh, several weddings as 2019 closed out. The, the conference was just around the corner and registrations were going through the roof. God was answering our prayers and and man, the rain, it felt good. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Let's hear the rest of the story with Elijah. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets by the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah and said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And we sang that song, Fear is a Liar. Right now, Elijah is not really buying into God and God's narrative. He's buying in to fear. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. You know, sometimes when we are afraid, we also want to be alone. So he left his servant and went about a day away from him. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the broom bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. The journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. You know, 2020 has been really the year of the cave, right? 
uh, it is, uh, it's been a challenge. You know, Elijah began to fear because Jezebel was no joke. She was a prophet killer. You know, and later in the story of Elijah, you see that there is some good in Ahab. And I think Elijah thought, maybe I'm winning over not just the hearts of the people, but maybe even King Ahab as well. You know, Elijah had really put himself out there. He put himself on the line. And he believed that God was going to use that for greater things. He thought maybe this would be, bring lasting change to Israel. In Judea. But all he hoped for, it didn't materialize. And so, like I said, he wants to be alone. He leaves his servant. And maybe for many of us this year, this has been time where we've let relationships die, where we've let discipling and covenant relationships just kind of fall by the wayside. And, and maybe that's not true for everybody. You know, others have really actually gotten closer. We've connected more during this time, even if it's virtually. But then it's off to the wilderness for Elijah. And it's no real plan, right? This is not like Jesus going into the wilderness to get strong, to prepare for ministry. And this is Elijah going into the wilderness to find a bush, to take a nap, and hopefully die. Uh, that's a different wilderness. That's a discouragement wilderness. Uh, and then he takes off after some food for Mount Horeb. You know, I am a cave dweller. That's for sure. I go there sometimes. And when I go into my cave, I also become a caveman. Uh, I relate to Elijah here. Uh, and actually, I relate to Elijah on both ends. I, I think there are times when I really throw myself out there in faith, hoping that God will just catch me, hoping that God will let me walk on water. Uh, I, December of 1990, almost 30 years Almost to this coming up weekend, I was baptized into Christ. And that was a step of huge faith. Man, I, I forgot to talk to my parents. I didn't even tell my family. I was just like, I'm, I'm going for it. Uh, and that was a huge step of faith. 1991, I dropped out of college as a junior at University of Colorado to move to L.A. Uh, to help the campus ministry there. That was a huge leap of faith. Uh, 1998, I left my career in civil engineering after I graduated and became a licensed engineer, uh, left that career and began to go into the ministry. Then in 1999, Sean and I uh, were asked to move to the Middle East. In 10 days, we had a garage sale, packed up all our stuff and moved to Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, in 2013, once again, leaving my career in civil engineering after going back to it in 20. 2004, uh, and, and we began to lead the singles ministry in the Los Angeles church in 2013. And then 2017, moving all the way from Orange County, California to Orange County, Florida. And then taking on the World Discipleship Summit, working with leaders around the world. And, and all of these, it was just felt like God's going to do great things. Hearts are going to turn. It's going to be, and yet at times they, they don't pan out the way I hoped. Maybe even in my mind, God didn't hold up his end. And so I, I, I really relate to Elijah because he goes from this mountaintop, faithful experience to caveman in just a few verses. And I can be that way. Uh, I can definitely spiritually be like the kid having a fit at the grocery store, <laughs> kicking and screaming uh, while the mom is disowning me. I'm, I'm that guy. Uh, I can be like Elijah. God came to Elijah in his cave. Verse 10, it says uh, of 1 Kings 19, the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. You know, when God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? It's amazing about Elijah's response is that none of it is really true or current. <laughs> right? Like, like it is true, probably in a larger sense, but it's not current information. 
he says that the Israelites have rejected your covenant. Well, just a minute ago, he was saying, you're turning their hearts back to your covenant. Well, he just said that they have torn down your altars. No, no, no. They just destroyed the altar of Baal and rebuilt the altar of Yahweh. He's saying they put to death your prophets, God. Well, is that current? No. Currently, 450 prophets of Baal were probably still rotting on the ground where they were killed. I'm the only one left, he said. Well, he just had a conversation with Obadiah saying, there's a hundred other prophets that I have kept hidden from Jezebel. And now they are trying to kill me too. Who is they? It's one person. It's the queen. It's Jezebel. You know, he goes from being very faithful to viewing everything through a dark, negative lens. And again, this is me. Uh, I think my cynicism can take over because cynicism feels safer and it feels more informed. And who I become when I am in my cave is a worrisome person. My wife gets very worried when I'm in caveman mode, when I'm in faithless mode, when I'm in cynicism mode. And, you know, you guys as a church, you probably don't see that version of me that often. Just know that my wife does. And I know that though I try to hide it from them, I'm sure my kids do as well. You know, some of the guys on staff, they see it because I don't hide. I got to have some people deal with caveman Marshall. So Brian sees it. Jose sees it. Bill Ellis sees it. These guys see the caveman version of me, because I have to talk. Elijah got super discouraged. You probably even say depressed. Why? Because all he wants to do is take a nap uh, and does not feel any better than his ancestors. And even after he sleeps, you know, he, he, he runs off to Horeb. But here's the thing. I think Elijah was at least self-aware enough to know I don't want to stay at this spot. And you know why I think that? Because of where he went. He ran and hid in a cave, yes. But where was that cave? It just wasn't any cave. It was Mount Horeb. Why there? What else happened here? Well, this is where God first revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush. This is the mountain of Yahweh, the mountain of God. This is where Moses was told, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. It's also the place where the Israelites, after they uh, crossed through the Red Sea, it was their first encampment uh, where they had no water. And for three days they cried out and God provided water to quench their thirst. This is where God met with Moses in a cloud and and first gave the Israelites his written commandments, his law that was meant to bring them life. This was the Israelites' last stop before going into Canaan. It's where Moses gave his last address. It's where Joshua was appointed leader. Great things were coming. Yes, Elijah was hurt, burned out, disappointed, negative, cynical, but I think he was also thirsty for God and wanting to be refreshed. I think he wanted to be talked out of being a caveman. I think he wanted to be talked out of being cynical. And that's where he went to meet with God, and hopefully God was going to show up. You know, if you're going to go into a cave, and many of us maybe have been in a cave this year, you better pick your caves wisely. Some of us go into real dark places when we're isolated and discouraged. And and maybe 2020 has been that way for you. Maybe it's been a year of a cave. Uh, But which cave have you chosen? There's some dangerous caves, like caves of self-medication, caves of impurity, caves of drinking, caves of social media and Facebook and Netflix, caves of extremism, caves of politics and division and hatred and circular thinking. And some of us have been in that cave way too long. For some of us, it's just been a cave of depression or fatigue or maybe even indifference. You know, when you go into a cave, make sure it's somewhere on the mountain of the Lord and leave that lifeline open to God. 
Read your Bible even if there's nothing jumping off the page. Pray even when it feels like you're talking to walls or trees. Connect to the body of Christ even if it's over the internet. Uh, I believe when we are in that cave, we really as disciples want to be coaxed out. We want to connect with God and one another. So go to the mountain of the Lord and wait upon God. We read in 1 Kings 19, it says, The Lord said, go and stand on the mountain of the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood before the mouth of the cave. And the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's amazing. This is the same conversation that God had before his presence passed by. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah had all these gripes. And then God sends fire and earthquakes and violent winds and then a gentle whisper. And as he stands in front of the cave, God asks him the same question. And and you would think that Elijah would kind of reel it in now. You'd think that Elijah would be like, okay, I spoke once in my cynicism and in my negativity, but now let me church it up because I'm now in the presence of God. What does Elijah say? Same thing. I've been very zealous for you, God. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death, and I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. Isn't that great? That's the same answer. You've got to love Elijah. Why? Because he's real. Like, even in the, like when God is not present, he's super negative. And even in the presence of God, he's like, I'm still in the same place, but I, I want to work it out with you, God. I want to get out what's in here and work it out with you. He's very real. You know, we've seen the earth quake under the fear of a global pandemic, and maybe that makes us want to stay in our safe place. We've seen the fires of civil and racial and political unrest literally burning down our cities. Maybe we want to stay in the cave with people like us that think about us, been so proud of the church here in Orlando, being willing to have a lot of uncomfortable conversations and find unity in the Make Every Effort class that has just finished this week. We look forward to the diversity team that's going to form from that to face these issues. You know, we've seen violent winds blow away our economy, our jobs, and our our way of life, and, and maybe that makes us want to stay in our cave. But when do you hear God? When do you hear His voice? You know, you won't hear it on the news. He has no interest in human wisdom. You won't be able to find it if you search for it on Google, right? His wisdom is far above our own. You can't hear it over your own arguments, conspiracy theories, and rants. Uh, He is not beholden to your understanding, nor does he acknowledge your ways. That gentle whisper, that's God. When we, we hear God, I think, when we're finally still, of all the worry and the anxiety, all the pride and division and self-reliance, it's then that the gentle whisper of God begins to talk to us. Exodus 14 14 says, The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Psalm 37 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Man, being still is hard. It's hard to just be still and connect with God. And I love that Elijah is willing to connect with his God. And I'm grateful that that God is willing to connect with Elijah, not just on the mountaintop, but also when he is depressed. You know, God gave Elijah some specific directions. In 1 Kings chapter 19, 15 through 18, he tells Elijah to basically do what prophets do. He he tells him two kings to anoint. He basically says, anoint 
King Jehu over Israel. Go anoint Ahaziah, king of Judah. Go anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. I mean, go and do what prophets do. That's what he says. You know, the first thing actually God says is go back the way you came. You know, it, it is fun, funny that, that God sends you right back into the battle. When we want to go into our cave, we're hoping that the cave has a back door or a secret passageway to where we don't have to go back and deal with the things that drove us to the cave. And yet God is sending Elijah right, go back exactly the way you came, exactly to where Ahab and Jezebel are waiting for you. Exactly to where you just made a huge stink. Exactly to where everybody wants to kill you. Go back there and appoint these kings and appoint Elisha the prophet. The other thing he says is, I reserve 7,000 who have not bowed down to Baal. Uh, You know, God is telling Elisha, you are not alone. There are a hundred other prophets that are waiting for you. There is 7,000 that God has reserved that have not bowed down to Baal. But when you're in the cave, you don't see all those things, right? Maybe like Elijah, we feel like, I'm the only one faithful. I'm the only one still watching church at 10 o'clock, you know? I'm the only one commenting and giving my contribution online. You're not the only one. You may feel like you're the only one. And we even today sang the song, You're the one, you're the only one. But that's about God. That's not about, we didn't sing that song about you. Uh, Once you reconnect with God, you leave the cave with a purpose. At some point as disciples, we need to get out of our caves and do things that disciples do. And they're not new things. You go back the way you came. You share your faith. You serve your neighbors. You meet new people. You share the gospel. You get together. You confess your sins. You pray. Imagine if God has reserved 7,000 open people in Orlando for you to meet. My guess is it's a lot more than that. But if each of us in the church shared with one person a day, all right? We're not talking about 100 people a day. We'd find those 7,000 in this first year. That's all it would take is for disciples to get out of their cave and meet one new person today and say, hey, this is the church I go to. And give them the YouTube link (laughs) for now. Uh, You know, we need small group leaders to do what small group leaders do. Get their people together. See how folks are doing. Pray together. Meet needs. We need the evangelists to do what evangelists do. You know, we appointed Jose an evangelist, and he got a job right after that, and he's leaving us. So that leaves some room for others to raise up. We've got some exciting plans for the tribe ministry, for our campus ministry. We can't announce those things yet, but but believe me, guys, we're going to do what we need to do in the ministry. Uh, And we're excited to see this church grow. You know, we need our church to do what churches do. Uh, there's new ministry centers. There's, there's people, Orlando is, is growing. You know, it, people are moving here like crazy. And the way we did w- with Claremont, with Space Coast, we need to start new ministries. We need to anoint and recognize these new ministries like Oviedo, like Lake Nona and Davenport and Haines City and, and, and all the north cities like Sanford and DeBerry and Deltona and DeLand. And, and how do we come back together as a church? Well, we don't have a plan yet. And so those can be great ministry centers. Let's dream for what we can do in 2021 and beyond. And the dream is bigger than just moving out to those cities because you have a better house and better land. With more people moving there, you know what they don't have when they arrive? Friends or a church. You can be both for them. You can welcome them as they move into your community and be the church and be the friend that they need. You know, we need to continue to serve the poor and needy. And I'm so thankful for all the years that Juanita Martin and her team served in the Hope Orlando chapter. I'm so proud of J.J. Lull and and, and this new team that he is building to serve here in, in Orlando. So these are this is God saying, go back the way you came and do what you need to do. Uh, and I'm excited to see what we're going to be doing 
uh, for Hope Orlando. Elders need to do what elders do. I am thrilled that the elders have found an elders and shepherding training curriculum. And we've had like 10 to 12 guys being trained right now for the shepherding ministry. They're all scared to death finding out what elders actually do and the biblical requirements and, and really what it means to, to shepherd and help and take on and responsibility and to serve. And it's a good fear. It's a fear that makes you rely on God uh, and also a healthy respect. I'm so thankful for Barry, Eddie, and Mike, and Jeff and the years that they have served in the church. But they need help. And as we raise up other shepherds and elders, it's God's way of sending us back the way we came to do what disciples need to do. Which brings us to our focus and our theme for this year of 2021. You know, uh, we have focused a lot on diversity uh, this year, right? Um, But the truth is, God is not glorified in our differences. Uh, I am so thankful that we are a diverse church because not all churches are very diverse. But you know what? Schools are diverse, Companies are diverse. Neighborhoods are diverse. And even some churches are diverse. But what, when is God glorified? He's glorified in our unity. When diversity becomes unity, then that is the marker of the body of Christ. Amen? Look at these passages, Romans 12, 4 through 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, these members don't all serve the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to each other. 1 Corinthians 12 says, just as a body, though it has many parts, and all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. We're all baptized by one spirit to form one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Later in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, God has placed the parts of the body. You didn't even get a say in it. God put these people in your church, even the ones that drive you nuts, just as God wanted it to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And so 2021, our theme will really be Ephesians chapter 4. This idea of oneness. As a prisoner for the Lord, I I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is maybe the most challenging passage of Scripture for many of us this year. Be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. We've had to put this passage into practice this year. Ephesians 4.4 4 says there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Our theme for this year, now if you thought Vision 2020 was creative, Get ready for this one, 2021. So our theme this year will be one. I know, that that really took a lot of creativity. But think about it. This is what we need right now. This is what we need as a church. This is what we need as a country. This is what we need as a world, is really to come under the one headship of Christ and to really draw all men to one God, Jesus, our Lord. And so as the months go on, we're just going to take each one of these first seven uh, one parts of Ephesians chapter 4 and focus on those. So January, the one body. February, one spirit. How does the spirit work in us and through us to provide unity? What hope do we have? The one hope will be March, April, one Lord. Lordship is such a huge uh, topic. And and even other churches are beginning to really understand in a more profound way that it's not just about accepting Jesus. More and more churches are becoming familiar with this language of Lordship. And so we need to continue to preach the Lordship of Christ. One faith, 
uh, one baptism? What do we believe about the conversion process? Wouldn't it be amazing to, to have a great harvest uh, during the month where we teach on conversion and teach on the importance of baptism? And then one God. And then the rest of Ephesians chapter 4 really talks about equipping the saint. It's kind of how the church all works together. And I think this is really important to do this because one of the things I kind of hear from time to time, and I think this is probably from people launching it from their cave, is the word leadership. Well, the leadership of the church or well, the almost like that's a bad word. Guys, I am so thankful for the leadership of this church. Uh, Because in many ways, that's all of us. That is all of the small group leaders, all the volunteers, all of our hope coordinators, uh, the eldership, the ministry staff, those who have decided to take on responsibility, those who are training to shepherd. uh, We're not alone. None of us are Elijah in the cave thinking we're the only ones left in the ministry. Uh, We're all part of the leadership of this church, and it is such a large group, uh, and so I'm so thankful for it. But we got to figure out how that all works. Ephesians 4 says Christ gave apostles, then prophets, then evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ can be built up until we reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So this is all about growth and maturity and actually working together like a body. And then it says, we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. Gosh, there's so many waves crashing back and forth, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Gosh, this has been a year where we're trying to be pulled apart by every wave of teaching. And we need to be anchored in the truth. It says, instead, speaking the truth in love will grow and become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. And that is Christ. So that is our theme this year. One. Uh, We want to see the body of Christ one. We want to see our allegiance to one Lord, one God, one faith. One baptism, one spirit, one hope, and one body. You know, uh, I, I chose this scripture to end on and, and to uh, take communion, and then I realized it's, it's 2021. It's John se- chapter 17, verses 2021. This is Jesus on the eve of his arrest, trial, and the next day, death and, uh, for, for our sins. And Jesus, of course, prayed the longest prayer recorded in Scripture by the Son of God. And he said, my prayer is not for them alone. He he wasn't just praying just short term for those disciples in that moment. But he began to turn his attention to us. He says, I pray that for those who will believe in me through their message. And that's us. I have never met. Jesus Christ. I've never seen him in the flesh. I've never sat down and taken communion with my Lord. I've never put my hand in his side and my my fingers in the holes in his hands. Like Thomas, I I, I will never get to, to do that or perform that. This is something I believe that he is the Son of God only because I was told this message through God's word. And knowing that Jesus prayed for me is powerful. And what did he pray for me and for you? That all of us might be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know, that doesn't just mean group think and unity for unity's sake. We're certainly not there. And that's not even the ask. I mean, even Jesus and God and the Spirit they, they had to work these things out on the cross. Jesus said, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was tension in that relationship because of the sin of all mankind that he was willing to accept. And the sin that's in our church definitely provides that same tension. And so unity is a choice that we all make. It's something that Christ prayed for. And it's something I believe 
is the marker of the true body of Christ. Followers of Jesus. And so, as we take communion today, let us commit to oneness. Let us commit to unity in this next year. And guess what? You don't even have to wait until January 1st to start this. We can begin to speak the truth in love. We can begin to forge unity. And I really believe that we have made great strides in our unity this year. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for that one Lord, for our one Savior, uh, for our one advocate that now sits at the right hand uh, begging uh, for us and pleading on our behalf. Thank you so much for the blood that was shed that forgives all of our sins, that, that coaxes us out of that cave. Thank you for the gentle whisper of Jesus uh, who calls us, beckons for us to meet him at the mouth of that cave, uh, not with violent winds or fires or earthquakes, but, but with his gentle whisper of love. Uh, may we be uh, brought out of our caves and, and really to a place of unity this year that the world might know that you have sent us and have called us. Thank you for Jesus that makes it all possible. It's in his name we pray. Amen.